Division 11, Battalion 5 and 2, Fire 7, Have Rescue 24. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're going to do a video lecture for chapter 18, Cardiac Emergencies. And let's get started. There's a lot to talk about today. So, Cardiac Emergencies. So what is going to be our etiology? What's going to, what are we looking at when we're trying to determine what is going on with someone who is having chest discomfort, chest pain, is it a cardiac related chest pain, et cetera. And so when we're looking at something like that, let's talk about something that would stop oxygen from being able to be delivered to the cardiac tissue. And so we know blood carries oxygen. It feeds those cardiac cells but it has to be able to reach the heart tissue in order to oxygenate it. Atherosclerosis is one problem in that cardiac area that would cause blockage or cause blood to be restricted to the heart muscle. It's usually caused by a cholesterol or, or other fatty substance buildup, and it forms this plaque inside the walls, inside the walls here, of the cardiac vessel. And you can see, what do we have here? We have that, and what do we have on top? We have all these platelets that are attacking this fatty piece of uh, cholesterol blockage here. And so that's when we talk about giving aspirin to reduce those platelets from aggregating. And that's exactly what you have here. They're aggregating to this plaque. But damage, it can, damage the vessel as well. And the damage to the coronary artery can become so um, severe that it can either, you know, 50% blockage or even a total 100% blockage. And that will lead, that would lead to <clears throat> what we know is a acute myocardial infarction. If, and this vessel appears to be a hundred percent blockage. Uh, if blood could get by, you're looking at, you know, it could be a 50% blockage, et cetera. And so the symptoms obviously will be different depending on how much blood flow is able to get to the heart muscle. All right. And so here we go with when we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a thrombus versus an embolus. So here's a thrombus. It's a piece of, of, of a plaque buildup here that's occluding the artery. And so you have the embolus who breaks off of the thrombus and travels through the blood vessels. And that later that embolus, of course, could become a pulmonary embolus. So how do we get there, right? How do we, how, do, how did this all start? Well, patients uh, with atherosclerosis, heart disease have certain risk factors and there's certain risk factors that they can control. One being blood pressure. If I have, I, I have high, if I have high blood pressure, right, that's a controllable risk factor because I can take antihypertensive medication to control that. I can exercise to keep that heart muscle as healthy as possible. I have diabetes. Well, diabetes is a controllable risk factor because I can stay on top of it. I can take my insulin like I'm supposed to, et cetera. Just like diabetes, high cholesterol is a manageable risk factor. I can take medication for that. I can exercise for that. I can do a lot of things to make that very, you know, to make that, that risk factor better. And I can choose whether to smoke or not. I don't have to smoke. That's something that, that is manageable. Things that aren't manageable would be like your race, your sex. You can't uh, manage your genes. So if somebody in your family 
has heart disease, there's a higher chance that you will too. We have a picture here of a heart and you'll notice that we have some necrotic tissue in the posterior part of the heart. It appears to, I'm sorry, the inferior part and it does look posterior as well. You'll, looks like it's the left ventricle. And so that's necrotic tissue. It's dead heart tissue. It's probably from this, uh, this coronary artery here at one point in time was probably blocked. And if you compare this left anterior descending LED probably here to the posterior vessel here, um, you can tell there's a difference. This one's a much bigger, but anyway, so what we're looking at here is something that causes myocardial ischemia. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about right now is myocardial ischemia and how we deal with that. So let's talk about acute coronary syndrome for a second, um, or ACS, and that's a term that's used to describe any group of sy symptoms that's consistent with myocardial ischemia. Okay, so talking about that, we have a gentleman here who more than likely he's been on a run. Looks like he's been exercising and it's having chest tightness or chest discomfort. Okay. So let's look at some of these, some of these, uh, terms. So we have stable angina, unstable angina and progressive angina. So stable angina would be a patient who has some type of blockage to a coronary vessel. They're not getting all of the blood that's, that the heart needs when the heart is placed in demand, meaning uh, you're exercising or you're walking up some stairs. Your heart requires more oxygen because it's beating faster. So stable angina in this case would be a blockage where the heart is still receiving blood, is still being oxygenated, but not uh, efficiently enough uh, when the heart is placed in demand. If it's relieved by rest or medication, um, then it would meet that, air, that term of stable. Stable angina also occurs at a fixed frequency. It's fixed, meaning it's going to happen on a fixed frequency if I decide to climb up three flights of stairs. Every time I go up three flights of stairs, I get this chest discomfort. If I sit down uh, and I rest, it goes away. If I take some nitro, it goes away. Um, the pain does not last. Let's compare stable angina with unstable angina. So just like stable angina, it may or may not be relieved by rest. Okay, but it's without a fixed frequency. That's your difference, meaning I can't tell you when it's going to happen, but it happens. I walk down to the end of the hall and it happens. I walk down to the end of the hall next week, it doesn't. I go up two flights of stairs, it happens, etc. Okay, so without a fixed frequency, and most of the time, unstable in China, uh, it, the pain may get better, but it's never, it may never go away, et cetera, but uh, may or may not be relieved by rest or medication and stable angina. It's always relieved by rest or medication. Progressive angina is one that, um, 
its stable or unstable angina that accelerates in frequency and duration. So what that means is, is that uh, I know two flights of stairs is going to cause my chest discomfort to start. Uh, but today I went up one flight and it started. Okay. And it didn't end in five minutes. It proceeded for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, or I walked down to the end of the hall. And before I got there, my chest uh, started having some discomfort. And so that means that it's happening more frequent and with less duration than someone who has stable angina. So progressive and unstable angina are both very uh, dangerous symptoms to have because myocardial infarction could be actually knocking on that person's door. Also, these symptoms are always uh, chest pain, you know, difficulty in breathing, nausea. All of them are very similar or the, not even similar. They're the same as a patient who's having an acute myocardial infarction. And so it's hard to, it's hard to uh, differentiate these in the field. And so we're going to always treat them for the worst case scenario, which would be uh, acute myocardial infarction. Before we go there, I want to talk about the acute myocardial infarction. I uh, hear this is a representation of an acute myocardial infarction. We have dead necrotic heart tissue. A blood flow was not restored quick enough. We had cells that died and that cellular death led to tissue death. Anytime you have an angina, that's not what you're dealing with. Angina is not associated with tissue death. And that's where that comes from. Okay, let's talk about aortic aneurysms real quick. Here we have uh, on the left here, we have a normal aorta. And on the right, we have a large aorta. This is a representation of the abdominal aorta. But if you go up just a little bit, you'll see the aortic curve. That would be your thoracic aorta. So an aorta uh, dissection is when the, there's an actual tearing of the tunica intima. And you see this tunica intima represented here. All right, so that tearing, um, blood would be forced then into the tunica media and, step, and there would be actually a separation of inside the blood vessel. The tunica media, media would actually separate from the tunica intima and it's that separation um, that is related to the word dissection. Okay, so when we talk about when we talk about hypertension and hypertension crisis, these are the things we worry about. About 20% of, of people that have aneurysms repaired um, suffer from hypertension. There's also other, uh, other risk factors uh, for developing an aortic aneurysm. Uh, one, I guess I already mentioned hypertension, um, inflammatory disorders, coronary artery bypass, a, um, aortic valve replacement. So all of those would put someone at a higher risk category. Also, um, usually it's hereditary. Uh, if a close relative uh, had a history of a aortic aneurysm, they normally they normally check the very close relatives of those patients to make sure they're not suffering from the same condition. All right, and so when we're talking about how we're going to re so we have a we have a problem, we are suffering from an acute MI. How is that fixed? We have to restore blood flow. 
And the way we do that is either by either by let me see, I thought I had a better slide. Either by a cardiac catheterization, right? Where they go in, put a stent in to open up that vessel and the stent is uh, capable of keeping the vessel open, supporting it, allowing blood flow to return to the muscle. Or if that vessel has been too damaged, we will have to actually do what they call a bypass surgery where a vein is taken from the patient's leg and placed uh, at the aorta and then grafted from the aorta just past the clot and that allows blood flow to come in front of that clot and that obviously restores blood flow. Other treatments for heart disease if we have an electrical stimulus problem, we can, you know, the fuse box is, is the issue, not, not necessarily the heart muscle. You can have a pacemaker installed. And most of these pacemakers have the capability of defibrillation as well. So that if you needed, uh, if the heart was having problems with irregular rhythms, uh, the pacemaker could actually provide a shock to shock the heart back to a normal rhythm. We also have devices like this one. This is a left ventricle assist device. Um, these are usually placed uh, secondary to cardiogenic shock when the left ventricle has had so much tissue death that it no longer can support the art of pumping. It no longer has that strong contraction that it needs to contract blood up and out the aorta. And so a left ventricle assist device is placed there to do that. These are usually temporary until someone, to, until someone can receive a heart transplant. Moving on to the chain of survival. Um, this is very important. You see, we have lay rescuers. Lay rescuers are capable of calling 911, doing CPR, and providing an AED. So all three of these are very important. That's why uh, it's very important for citizens to be trained in CPR um, and also trained uh, in the use of an AED. Now, even though these AEDs are self-explanatory, they tell you where to put the patches. They tell you everything to do, which is very helpful. Very little training is needed for that. Um, but CPR is extremely important. And then we have the EMS component, um, getting EMS to the scene as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, if the AED is not available, to provide that shock that's much needed to some patients, the recon for EMS to recognize that we have a ST elevated MI, be able to call that STEMI alert. That, that allows uh, the patient sometimes to actually bypass the emergency department and go straight to the cath lab. And then the patient from the cath lab to the intensive care unit. When we're talking about defibrillation and rapid defibrillation, it works best, obviously, the sooner the better, but within two minutes of the onset of cardiac arrest. Uh, impossible for EMS to do that. That's why the AED program has been so successful uh, in the chain of survival. Anytime one of these links in the chain are broken, uh, that's going to decrease the chance of survivability for the patient suffering uh, from cardiac arrest. When we're talking about acute myocardial infarctions again, being able to recognize them early. We have a patient here who's obviously pale, um, looks very malice. Um, if he is having just chest discomfort, it's something then we should start already looking at a patient like this and suspecting a possible AMI. Again, 
extremely important for us to recognize that that uh, STEMI patient early so that the patient can be transported to an appropriate facility that provides percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI or, or angioplasty. Most deaths from acute myocardial infarction are caused by though the actual dysrhythmia of the heart. If there is necrosis, necrotic heart tissue, and it's located near the pacemaker of the heart, um, that could cause lethal rhythms. And those lethal rhythms, one being ventricular fib or VTAC. Dysrhythmia, uh, if recognized, um, it uh, can be treated uh, or prevented, if, if, but you have to recognize it, that they exist. The pain of the AMI is, uh, we attribute that pain to the actual cellular death. And we know that cellular death obviously leads, leads to tissue death. All right, so here we have a patient with um, cardiac type chest pain. Um, what we need to be aware of though is a cardiogenic shock in this case. Um, we're looking for a patient who, if, if they're in cardiogenic shock, they more than likely have had enough tissue necrosis to affect the pumping or the contraction of the heart. Um, and if so, if the heart can't contract appropriately, that will lead to heart failure. Patients normally present with uh, peripheral edemia, edemia, edema, <laughs> dysrhythmias, jugular vein distension, crackles. Um, they'll be anxious or air hunger. And understanding that they'll present like a respiratory, even after correcting the so-called air hunger with CPAP or, or O2 via non rebreather, um, it's only going to continue to get worse because we don't have a respiratory problem here. Here we have a cardiac problem. It's also when we're looking at blood pressure, these patients are profoundly hypotensive because obviously similar to obstructive shock where the heart is being smothered and can't contract, patients are gonna be very hypotensive. And the treatment for these patients are, we're going to administer oxygen just enough to where we get around 94%. We don't want any more than 94% because of the free radical theory, uh, preserve body heat, IV access, and prompt transport to an ER, or hopefully calling that STEMI alert, you can go straight to the cath lab. Here we have, here we have a patient who, um, a little different now, we're talking about heart failure, not from, well, uh, it's heart failure, different type of heart failure. Here we have a patient super hypertensive. He's been non-compliant with hypertension medication for a while. And he's, he has so much preload and so much afterload that the left ventricle can't pump against it. Too much for the left ventricle at this point. The left ventricle begins to fail. Uh, the number one cause of right ventricle failure is left ventricle failure. Um, so when we're looking at the left side of the heart, um, we're looking for a patient who is going to have rails, who is going to have um, all of the symptoms of right-sided heart failure, basically rails, bronchi, jugular vein distension, et cetera. Um, these patients tend to be super hypertensive instead of hypotensive. And that's because the body's tried to compensate uh, with the increase of preload for so long.
So uh, other signs for this, orthopenia, uh, agitation, secondary to hypoxia, peripheral, bilateral peripheral edema, uh, a possible productive cough with a pink sputum type pr productive cough. And the treatment for these patients, uh, an IV or INT, I, we try not to give any fluids at all to these patients. And nitroglycerin or chest pain, in this case, it would also help to reduce the preload. We talked about pulmonary edema already just a second ago. Hypertensive emergency. So hypertension is any systolic blood pressure that's greater than 140 systolic or 90 diastolic. Um, hypertensive emergency can be considered when a systolic pressure is greater than 180. You have a rapid increase in systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure of 120 millimeters per, of mercury. Uh, and this is just a transport and monitor the patient. That is all I have. Um, I will post this video and I hope it helps. And I will talk to you on the next video.